Hello everyone, my name is Aki Nicolaitis. I'm a graduate student in the neuroscience program. And today I'm gonna to talk to you about how we can use network analysis and machine learning to understand the learning process in the brain. So I came to the University of Illinois to study neuroscience because I'm really, I really care about empowering people through uh, fitness, through better sleep, through meditation, but most importantly through learning. And I think a lot of you here would agree with me that learning is really one of the most powerful tools for empowering people to live better lives. So once I got here and I started digging into this MRI data, it became really clear to me that if we're gonna understand this learning process in the brain, we need a lot of help. Just as an example, um, fMRI, 10 minute fMRI session. You take a person in, in 10 minutes, you get several million data points for that one person. And we know that the learning process may be represented in fMRI, but we also know that it's represented in other types of MRI, like structural MRI, or MRI that measures brain connectivity, or brain metabolism even. So if we're gonna bring all these things together and understand the learning process and what's different between good learners and slower learners, how are we gonna do this? Well, we need much more sophisticated statistical methods to do this. So that's where machine learning comes in. So machine learning is a field that's at the intersection of computer science and statistics, and it specializes in developing algorithms that, uh, that learn data. And it, they learn the data so that they can make predictions about future data that they haven't seen yet. But machine learning is really great at making predictions, but if the data that you don't give it is informative to the question that you're asking, it's not gonna be able to make any sort of predictions. So that's where network analysis comes in. So network analysis is a field of mathematics and computer science that, spe that specializes in studying the interrelationships between different objects. And, network, and, and using network analysis, we can quickly uh, extract networks out of data and analyze it and take some of the most important or fundamental aspects of that data out of the network really quickly. And so you can see that there's, is it frozen? There we go. You can see that there's some really good synergy here between these really big MRI data sets and these machine learning and big data analysis algorithms and then network analysis, which can you know, kind of bring out the most important information out of, the, out of the data so that you could feed it into machine learning algorithms and make good predictions. And so that's what I've been trying to do in my uh, graduate career is come up with a, you know, a pipeline to do this kind of thing. And uh, the basic idea is that we wanna predict what's the difference between people who are fast learners, people who are slow learners, or try to predict based on how people's brains change over the course of the learning process, predict how much they actually ended up learning. And so the process is pretty simple. We, uh, we take in this MRI data, and then we create the networks based on that data, and we visualize them. We can visualize them with really simple sort of visualizations like these graphs I have here, or we can visualize them with slightly more complicated visualizations like this one. So, in this uh, visualization, it's called a clustergram. It's a technique from genomics. Uh, what you're seeing is you're seeing all of the connectivity data for a large group of subjects in their subcortical network. So the subcortical network is a, a network in the brain that's really important for procedural learning, like learning how to ride a bike or learning how to play the piano or something like that. So we thought that you know, if this network is informative with regards to how well the procedural uh, learning is gonna happen, then we should expect that based on how well people's brains are wired up in this network, we should be able to predict how well they're gonna perform in a procedural learning task. And so that's what we did. We fed that information into our machine learning algorithm and we found that we could predict better than chance in all of the different uh, subtasks within this pr procedural learning task. But then if you look back at this cluster visualization that, that I was showing earlier, you see that there are these two clusters, right? There's this one up here and one down here. And the question was, maybe this visualization can help us understand not just that the subcortical network more broadly is involved in the procedural learning task, which is something that we understand from neuroscience already, but maybe what specifically about the subcortical network is involved in the learning task. And so we put that into our machine learning algorithm, and up here on the upper left, we found that we could make, we could predict about at the same accuracy as we could with the full network. And interestingly, when we just look at the leftovers, so the things that weren't in the cluster, we find that we are at chance, meaning that there's not really any informative information that's left over. So we were also interested in seeing, you know, 
we, we were predicting before how good people were going to perform at a procedural learning task, but we were also interested in seeing maybe we could look at pre-training differences in their brain connectivity and predict how much they were going to be able to learn over time based on how their brain was wired up before they even started the training. And we found that in the motor network, the part of the brain that uh, is involved in, um, in learning, motor learning like, uh, and, and, and movement, uh, we could predict over 50% of the variance in, in, this, uh, in, this in learning in this task. And so the things that I'm showing you today are very preliminary and they're all uh, you know, very exploratory in nature. But, and, and they're also all with brain data, but there's no reason why it couldn't be applied to combinations of brain and behavioral data or just purely behavioral data as well. Um, and I'd like to thank my advisor, Art Kramer and Paris Smaragis, for helping me with this and my undergraduates and all of you for your attention. Thank you very much.